All right. Well, it looks like I maybe figured out this Google Hangouts on Air, YouTube Live combination of stuff here. So uh, I've got my printer here, and then uh, Stefano is on. Is that right, Stefano? It's Stefano. Stefano. All right. So Stefano's got uh, his printer set up, and he's running into a pretty common problem on kind of the final stages of building on these style printers, and that's aligning the cross rods and the side drive rods uh, kind of all together because there's a lot of degrees of freedom uh, on this assembly, which is good. It means you can adjust out a lot of things if your frame isn't exactly perfect and things, but it also means that adjusting it in the first place takes a bit of time. So, uh, Stefano, why don't you uh, kind of talk about what you're running into and we can start working through your problem. Okay, so what I'm running into is everything is very stiff. So I can move this with my hand okay. Diagonally works okay, but then when I come to turn the knobs here, it's pretty hard and the steffers definitely can't turn it. And so everything just seems stiff. But when I align these, I put the rod on, and these are printed from Pet G, and I used the brass bushings. And mm -hmm. I put the bushings on the rod, put the print between them, and then slowly eased them in. And everything ran smoothly, when, but I put everything on and put the belts on. Nothing. Everything was already stuck and jammed up. Okay. So, um, you know, I've got these alignment pieces, so these could go in each, each of the corners. Honest opinion, you don't really need them. They're more of like a starting point. What it does is it sets the rod positions in relation to the top of the frame here. So uh, let's see if I can get this zoomed in here. All right. Move. Move the carriage out of the way here. So what, what we've got is the two different rods at two different heights here, and they're in relation to, see if I can move it in such a way that it makes sense, these two rod heights that are different. So these are going to set them for what this printed at, the height difference between these two. Now, print them in Z. Normally, you get pretty good resolution in your Z on most printers because it's kind of your, your smallest increment on there. Um, but you're aligning it to this. What you really need to do is be aligning it to this. So this, using these things in the corners, I think this is the right one. Nope, because there's like a right hand and a left hand yeah. version of these. You know, they fit basically over and can hold to the rod, and you print them for each four corners, and then you can flip the printer upside down and then kind of seat the rods, you know, into these valleys on here, and it'll it'll get you close. But again, that's aligning you to this. Um, so what I like to do is, let's see, I don't know what that is. It just popped up. Um, I like to make sure that I get my, my top rods aligned, uh, the top side rods aligned to the uh, the top of the frame. You can do that with a caliper. You can do that with those alignment tools, whatever you want. But you basically want those not to be like this. Um, so you want to uh, choose this as your datum plane that everything else will be going off of. So you set those rods. Once those rods are set, they're pretty much, you know, just, just don't touch them. Where your adjustment will come in, is on these lower rods. And the easiest way to do that that I've found is right now I've got, uh, let's see, this isn't one of the ones that's belt tensioned. I've got the version one, or I call it version 1.5 because I modified it a bunch, but I uh, used to Theo. So this is the one that I printed and, and built based off of Jason Smith's original design, and then I added to it, and then I modified that model and made changes to it and made the version two that more of the people have built now, and that's, I assume, the one that, that you print. So you don't yeah, have yeah. these these long belts. You've got the motors that are going to be mounting on the side. Yeah, I've got, I've got the Z 
over here. Oh, yeah, but oh, those yeah. are for the X. Yeah, my yeah, mount's mount. over there. Yeah, so you've got the hole through one of these mounts, and the motor's going to mount on the outside on those brackets. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so what, what I would have to do is I, I would have to loosen up these. Let's see if I can back it back up here. Sorry. I'd have to loosen up uh, these bolts down here and then take tension off of the belt going up to here. You don't have your motors installed yet, and that's good. You want to get everything aligned before you start putting force on that motor or on the shaft with the motor and the belt and everything from it. You always want to have it kind of free moving okay. right now. So then what you do is you're going to pull the carriage into one of the corners. Just pick one, we're gonna call that corner one, and you're gonna loosen up the bolts. Just on the lower one? Yeah, just just on the lower one. Get it basically as far as you can into the corner, loosen them up, and then just kind of let it float. Find out where it wants to be in relation to your carriage. Okay. And my top rail should be aligned. Let me just grab my calipers. Yep. Actually, they're in the other room. I'll be back. Just give me a few seconds. No problem. Never mind. They're right here. And it's kind of a tough measurement to, to take. There's the angle bracket at the top here that's in the way and stuff. That's why I made those alignment tools. Yes. Yeah, like you're, you're only aligning to that print, um, not necessarily to the carriage when you're using that. Mm-hmm. So I aligned before those tools, so I'll just check. Yeah, they're aligned to half a millimeter. Okay. Yep. Say. Yep. So you you've got your uh, you've got that rod. So then let let your your lower rod, just one of the lower mounts, let it float and kind of find where it wants to be. Okay. So just kind of let it float. And then it's kind of tough to tighten it without introducing error into the system. It's like the whole Schrodinger's cat thing. You know, you can't you can't observe a system without affecting it sort of deal. But you, you just got to kind of get it loose, let it float, and, and just kind of snug it down. Don't crank anything down yet until – because you might have to go around a couple of times just to let the carriage and everything find equilibrium. Okay. So I'll just get it down just so it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now go to one of the other corners. Just move it, you know, we'll call that corner two. Okay, here we go. Yep. <clears throat> I assume the same thing with the lower rod. Yep, yeah, you're only touching the lower rods. Your upper ones, so long as they're aligned to the top of the this, we're just going to assume that that, that 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 plane that made your frame, so long as it's you know a well-built frame, if you use the Masumi ones that are cut in their factory, they're yeah. dead on. You know, I haven't tightened up uh, one of these mm -hmm. frames yet where they've been off. You know, they have really good yeah, cuts. I spent way too much time making sure all these distances were the same. Yep. Okay, there we go. So I think it's moved back again. Um, yep, and now one thing I'll tell you, the ones that get the pulleys on them, if you think about it, you're tightening it unloaded. Once you put that motor and belt on there, you may have to tweak around with it once you get it, you know, once you get it set. Hopefully we'll get all these four corners and you'll feel that it'll start to kind of smooth out. But, okay. um, but when you put that motor on there and you tension that belt, it's going to want to deflect it down so it can kind of repull things out. So, yeah, I yep. just like to decide. 
Yep. And we'll do the same over here. Yep. Okay, and then once more. Yep, next corner. And yeah, I can already feel it loosening up a ton. Yep, yep, because what the problem is, you're dealing with stack tolerances. So you've got the bottom face of that printed bearing holder for the shaft, and then the tolerance of the bearing that goes in there and the tolerance of the shaft and then the tolerance of the side carriage that mates to that and all of these things stack up. Uh, so trying to set it on like a theoretical perfect is never going to work unless all of your parts are perfect. Mm -hmm. Here, let me. Does it feel better so gonna... far? It does. I don't think I did this turn right. Yep. And, and it isn't going to probably take just one time around. What, what I've normally done is I've, I've done this, and then I've got that break-in G-code out on the GitHub. Oh, yeah. Yep. And so that's, you know, 150 millimeters a second. And so it's not crazy fast, but it's, it's fast enough. And when it comes into the corners and X cells and D cells, if it's got – Binding, especially when it does like a fast direction change, you're going to hear, hear kind of a, you know, kind of a, a hum, a chatter, because it's got friction, and you're going to really hear that when it's excelling and deselling. Um, the other thing is your bushings are are brand new, so they're it's as tight as it's ever going to be right now, and yeah, the plastic. So oh, go ahead. I was just saying they'll just loosen up over time. And... Well, I mean, yeah, they'll basically wear in because, you know, it's a it's an oil-impregnated bronze bushing on steel. So steel is going to be the thing that holds up, you know, hardened steel rods, and the, the bushings will be what wear in. Now, they're pretty long-wearing. I've had this thing running for two years, and I don't have any problems with my bushings yet, and I print mm -hmm. quite often. So it's not a problem, but... One problem is that a, normally a bushing is a lot tighter running fit than like, a, you know, like an LMUU style, you know, roller element bearing because the pathways on the inside of that are, are rubber that the balls are traveling through. They can actually take more misalignment than a bushing. Um, mm -hmm. So because, you know, the balls, you know, the ball elements can kind of roll and crush into the, you know, the inner part of the pathways on there a little bit and kind of take some of that out. Now, uh, another thing that's important on here, and you'll notice it, uh, well, one thing you'd notice it if you start printing, like, large square objects is if you don't have, I'm going to click back over to me here quick. I think the, there we go. Um, Maybe I can even tip this one down. I'm gonna pull out the element here. Tip it down. All right. Get this out of the way too. All right, so uh, I've got these two printed objects on the, I'll turn this down a little bit. There we go. Uh, these two uh, printed 
objects out on the on the GitHub. One of them has a, a 10 millimeter valley and one has an eight millimeter. Um, and they've got kind of an offset in here and that's for the offset and the height. That's for clipping onto, let's see, let's pick this one. Uh, clipping onto your 10 millimeter rod on one of the edges. And then onto the eight millimeter. That's close to me. Um, and so once you have everything all leveled and you know the rods are at the correct height, um, the pulleys that are on here, uh, you know, they have the set screw on them. If you loosen up the set screw on uh, on these pulleys tied to to this particular axis. You can move this thing and you could rack it like this. Mm -hmm. So you could potentially be out of square. So, do you so want what to I like to do is use that? these things uh, as long as they're printed accurately, because it's really tough on two shafts that are on two different, you know, two different centers to get an accurate measurement of that distance. So these things are good for making sure that your cross rod here is parallel to the side rod and then you do that all the way around and so long as your frame was square, square to begin with now you know that basically all of those rods are are true to each other where you run into a problem is if the printer that this center carriage was printed on wasn't perfectly square because what that means is that this axis printed internally within this, and this one may not be at 90 degrees to each other. So you may end up having to let it go just a little bit out of perfectly aligned with the side rod to keep from binding. Now that's less than ideal. If I was in that situation, I would reprint the center carriage uh, because that means that your travel would always be slightly off. You know, you're going to get out of square prints because your center carriage was out of square to begin with. Um, so, but it's, again, a lot of this is just finding where the printed parts that you have like to be as a sum of a total. Okay. Yeah. How, how is your carriage feeling right now, the center carriage? It's it's okay. I feel like if I run through it again, like the the x axis or the y axis, yeah, the x axis is a lot looser. Mm -hmm. But it's yep. overall, it's still pretty stiff. Yeah, and but it's simply looser than before. To be honest, even on a perfectly dialed in printer, it it is kind of stiff. You know, you've got this a lot of contact surface on this bronze bushing. It's not like an LMUU bearing where it, where it, uh, where it's really free running. They're, you know, they're low friction, but they're not as low friction as like a rolling element. Um, and also, again, you haven't broken in the printer, so once you break it in, it'll start feeling better. But even mine, let me switch over to me, and I've got two years worth of printing on on this. You know, if I put my finger on the center. I can, granted, yeah. I'm, hooked up, I'm hooked up to motors right now. If I undid the motor, I'll, I will undo the motors just to show you. The I, I can't even, I can't push this with my pinky finger without the motors right now. Yeah, Barely. so me, I'm just going to show you what mine works like without the motors just so you can get an idea. And when I first broke, broke mine in, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really free moving either. Yeah, but it it just starts to settle in, but it I probably have adjusted mine, you know, ten times since I you know from taking it apart and putting it back together for all the upgrades and so I kind of have a feel for it and you'll you'll get a feel for it the more you do the way that I always describe it is what to people building this for the first time is when it's right you'll just know. 
like you'll just be like, oh, that was that was it. So right now my motors yeah. are disengaged, and I, you know, I can I can move mine with my my pinky. I like I can move with my thumb, but <laughs> okay. Um, it's still pretty. <laughs> um, the other thing is, are you using the motors from the uh, from the bill of materials or different ones? Yeah, I'm using the robot dig, the huge ones. Yep. I mean, those are 60 millimeter long uh, steppers. I mean, in comparison to the sort of motors on like a Prusa or something like that. I mean, those are those have yeah, a torque are... range. Those have a torque range like on the order of what several NEMA 23 do. So it's, mm -hmm. it's got a fair amount of snort. Um, not yeah, to I'm say having some errors it. with my board. It's just like not moving them. I oh. posted stuff about it. I think I did the configuration file. I think I did something wrong in there. Okay. So what, uh, what did you say? I, I lost the first part of that. Uh, some of my steppers, they just, with controlling it manually through the Vicky 2. Yep. And I'm using an Aztec X3. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're just, they just don't move. They move really fast one direction and backwards they just click. And I know you're saying that could be because of the, could be because of the end stop. So I have yet to install those. Yeah. Um, I've, if you have the end stops installed, normally it'll let you, um, I can't remember which direction it'll let you go. It's it's been a while. We'll go positive. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it, it can go positive, but not negative, and that's until it's it's had a home. I, I can't remember. I think there's a G code where you can basically just tell it that it's homed. You know, tell it that it's zero. I'd have to look up. You know where the the rep rap wiki uh, G codes list is, right? Yeah. There's there's gotta be something. Yep. So I think there's a G code in there where you. Sorry, go on. Oh, just where you could basically like tell it that it's home, and, and then you could maybe move both directions. Um, okay, I'll try that. But right now I have to hook up the bed so it won't turn on. Yeah. I mean, either that, or if you have some end stops, just temporarily wire them in so you can click them. You know, or. Yeah, I don't have any of those plugs yet, so I need to get. Okay. Those that I've been soldering to the pins, and that's not nice to do. That's one thing that I'm sad about on the newest version. I know everyone else loves those plug ones. Every board up until the version three, I could get it in the screw terminal version from Roy at, at Panicap. And I wish that he still had it because that's my preference. But I'd, my day job has more to do with like industrial automation. Never mind. Yeah, so having a screw terminal, I can just shove a wire and tighten it down. That's my preference. No. Not crimping a bunch of tiny little wires. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I can, but yeah, so you're saying I just go around the printer a few times and then it should start to loosen up? Yeah, yeah. So um, I probably... The first time I ran mine, because I generated, uh, I think, I can't remember if it was Tim that originally had kind of a break-in G-code file, and then I made I made my own, you know, kind of the circle or the, the diamond square pattern one. Um, I probably ran it for a half an hour at 150, and then I ran it for a half an hour at 125% of that, and I kept bumping up my speeds. And now I can run it at, you know, 200% of that, so, you know, 300 millimeters a second. And it's traveling, you know, the majority of the distance diagonally on a 300 by 300 bed. So it's it's definitely up to speed. Um, mm -hmm. And, it you know, no problem at all. But my when I first started running mine, I kind of ran into the same problem. And that's probably what you'd find for most people in the group is, you know, when they first start running it, it's just it's just not there yet. And then they'll go around and tweak it and adjust those lower bearing blocks, run it around again, and 
and when it's finally there, you'll just be like, oh, man, you know, you start cranking up the feed rate percentage, and it'll just start yeah, feeling it better. It, it won't make the noises on the corners. So... I tell people this is the hardest part of the entire build. It's not squaring things up on the on the frame or bolting things on or even wiring it. It's getting getting this gantry to find where it wants to be. And once it's there, you know, I I haven't had to adjust this one in you know a long time. I haven't touched it. Uh, so it stays once it's oh. in there. It's not like it's real finicky and it's gonna fall, you know, come back out. It's just gotta kind of find its it's happy place. Okay. Okay. Get out the carriage. I assume you got to redo this all. What's that? If I change out the carriage later on, do I have to redo all the alignment? Um, no. There's actually a trick for that. So, if you notice the hole that the cross rods uh, go into um inside yeah. the the carriage are deeper than it needs to be the side carriages oh yeah so you're going to slide that out yeah so you you loosen it up and here i'll actually show that because someone else seeing this in the future would probably want to know so hold on let me okay. work on, on that so um yeah tip it back down here all righty uh just switch to your camera it's still on mine Oh, it looks like I'm on mine, but... Oh, yeah, it is now. Okay. Yep. So uh, the hole in these carriages that this rod goes into is deeper than it needs to be. So if you loosen up these bolts on the top to kind of pinch around those, you can slide it far enough that the rod can come, that can come out. Now, the problem is if you've got the belts, these side belts tensioned tight, you won't be able to rotate it far enough because you'll be pulling against the tension belt. So I normally have to take up the tension off of, let's see if I can pop this down. There we go. So uh, you have to take the tension off on, on these and then you can slide this thing over far enough and then come over to this side and this rod will be able to pop out the top and then you can pull it. Then you can pull that rod out this way. Do the same thing for. I'm really bad at pointing this. On the other side, and now you've got the two sides out. You can slide it out, and you didn't have to touch mm -hmm. any of your sides. And that's kind of the okay. kind of a key to being able to do that if you wanted to swap out this carriage for a different design. Because there's a bunch of good ones. But out even there. if you put in new bushings in a new print, will it still be okay? No, nah, because the carriage kind of sets the spacing of these rods where they want to be. If you've got a really dialed in printer, you know, and are printing it in an orientation, you know, if you get a little bit of print this in ABS and you get a little bit of warp, you're probably not going to be in the same spot as the other one that you wanted to be. Um, if this was printed like stacking up and in Z, I would be pretty confident that those offsets from each other would be the same from one printer to another. Because again, printers do really well in Z accuracy. Just normally in, in the X and Y is where more of the error is on most people's printers. Um, all right. Um, another thing I guess I'll mention in the video here, because it comes up, you know, quite often, although now more people are printing them in uh, PETG, so it doesn't work the same, but um, all of my uh, components on my printers are in, are in ABS. I used to just love printing in ABS. I'm, I'm more like, like most people now, PETG does 95% of what ABS can do for me. But one thing ABS can do that's really nice is be acetone softened, welded, and smoothed. So what I would do is take a Q-tip and dip it into just a cap full of acetone. And before I press this bushing in, I would rub the inside of that print. And then I dip it in the, into the uh, acetone again and do it again and do it again. Because I purposely designed the carriage 
holes for these on my ones, just slightly undersized, so it's a press fit in. But you don't have to worry about cracking it because you've softened the ABS with the acetone. Then you let it mm -hmm. kick. It takes quite a while to kick back over. You know, I probably wouldn't even think about putting it in a printer for a day, but once it's hardened back up, it's really locked in there. It's like you glued it in, but it also doesn't have the chance of splitting the ABS print like can be problematic. ABS is a lot more prone to that. You know, the inner layer bonding being not quite as good as like maybe a PLA or especially a PETG. All right. So I'm going to show you what was happening with this. Okay. Yep. Switching back over to you. Stepper over here. It's wired up to my X3 board. I got my Vicky. And if I go to pair and then move axis, mm -hmm. moving at one millimeter. Mm -hmm. And this is on my Y. No, it kind of it kind of just like locks when I go back, which I start homing issue. Do you move ten millimeters? It moves it about the same amount that move one millimeter does. Hmm. It kind of just like it's not even moving. It's just like. And you checked the you checked the inductance across your wires and made sure. That, yeah, I'm using the, the cables from Robot Dig as well. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, some people's cables and things like that. The, the only thing I do is if you can fit a multimeter down in to that little space there before it's going into the to the motor, you know. Um, you know, just just make sure that that as the pinout says on the board, you know, is is for the one coil and the next, that you're actually reading. Uh, you know, conductivity uh, between across that coil. You know, you can either measure in in you know ohms, or if you've got a multimeter that has uh, you know the kind of the audible sound. Just yeah. make sure that you are, because I had one uh, one time where I wired it up wrong uh, myself, and it would go in one direction just fine, but backwards it would step funny. So just you know, yeah. I'll take a look at that. Yeah. I did it for uh, one harness. This may be a different one. Yeah, I mean, it, it shouldn't be. It should be like a standard. I'm just saying, you know, when it comes to troubleshooting, the first rule is never assume the person before you did what they did right. And for, like, the, the VXY jerk in the yep. Vicky 2, what does that do? Okay, so jerk. Uh, I think that are they actually calling it jerk now? Because they they used to call that. Uh, oh gosh, what did they call that on in smoothie? Um, well, I don't, this isn't even smoothie though. Oh, this isn't. Oh, you have the X three. Never mind. I waited. I thought I would have it done by now, and now I saw the X five pro. Okay. Never mind, never Someone mind. I was thinking of the X5 Mini. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah. I've got, I've just got the normal X3. Yeah. No, that's okay. That board's been stout for, for me for a long time. Uh, you know, I ran my Herculean printer off that for, you know, I only upgraded that to Smoothie in the last few yeah. months. So, um, absolutely nothing wrong with Marlin. Just as you start going really fast, if you've got like, 0.9 degree steppers and high micro stepping, you're going to start stuttering. But uh, you know, for your for your average everyday printing, you know, 80, even 100, 120, I don't, I don't think you're going to have a problem. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to look into that later. That's a lot of technical stuff. Let's do over video. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, but I'll go on the way. I might, I might uh, open the question up to the more, you know. I, I know what I know about the printer electronics just because I've troubleshooted a bunch myself, but there's guys in our group that are, you know, way better with the electronics than I am. I just, 
you know, I fake it till I make it when it comes to the electronics. And if I let the smoke out, I buy a new one. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, but that's that's really odd that it goes in the one direction. It seems like just fine and backwards, like not the correct distance and not the correct speed. So. Yeah, I, I redid all the Marlin, the configuration, so I probably messed something up. So I'm going to redo oh. that again. Okay. Yeah, it's been a while since I've had to configure a Marlin config. So, um, But the original, um, I mean, if you wanted like a just works config and, and version of Marlin, the one that is in the original Eustathios uh, Spider GitHub was an X was an X3 uh, running basically all the same stuff except I had 0.9 degree steppers on on mine, which are a little less okay. torquey. So I mean, you change the steps per millimeter, and that uh, shoot, that's before they came out with the Vicky two, and that version of Marlin doesn't handle the Vicky yeah, two. Yeah, that, that's why I went with this. It's probably something little. I'll look into it. Okay. But, all right. For now, I'll go around this carriage a few more times doing that. All right. And um, be all set. Yeah. What other, any other questions you got for me right now while we got it on the video? Because this is, you know, this is really good stuff for somebody learning to build theirs for the first time. So that everyone runs into the same stuff. It's just whether or not they ask the questions normally, to whether or not they have to figure it out on their own. Yeah. I don't think so. I think the only thing I found that someone, I don't know, I don't know GitHub that well, but the extrusions for the the bed, yep. these aren't listed that have a hole drilled in the middle, I, I found. Oh, okay. I'll no, that's again a good... before I make that statement, but mine, I ordered directly from the GitHub and they did not come with those holes. Okay. No, that's that's very good to know. I'll look <clears throat> look into that because I know the version or the part number that Jason had in his original one, which that's the exact same extrusion as is in his. Mm -hmm. um, uh, had that on there, so I'll make sure. One thing I will say, and I'm gonna again just pop over to my my view. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing I never really liked that well about this particular bed support design. See if I can crank that thing down and drop this thing down here. So I can get down lower. There we go. Probably making everyone sick. All right, that's good enough. And I'll turn it to the back side because there's nothing. Um, that's a little bit hard to see because I got this cork in the way. I just clipped that under there to insulate the underside of the bed. But um, right now, this design assumes everything is perfect across X for things tied to the, the bed. And I'll, I'll kind of explain. We've got a rod at the bottom, which is bolted to a printed piece to the frame. So the frame's holding it rigid. It's got this, this printed piece to this rod to, maybe it'd be easier if I pop this thing out, um, you know, which goes to this, which ties to this, and is fixed in a distance, you know, mirrored between these two sides by this piece. So if your printed piece down here is a little fat, which moves this rod center in towards the center, mm -hmm. or if this piece here is, uh, you know, a little bit fat, uh, the Masumi guy, you know, cut this thing a, a hair long, whatever it is, it's going to end up putting... Uh, you know, putting tension against this rod and basically trying to force it into a bow. Okay. And then that can start, you know, putting and twisting and putting, you know, kind of a, a lateral force into the ball, into the lead screw or ball screw, which they tend not to like. And you can get that ribbing effect. So if, if people are getting that ribbing effect in Z, 
one thing to make sure is that if you run this bed all the way down, you know, uh, disconnect the lead screw or something like that, run it all the way down and just kind of feel how it moves as it's moving down towards the bottom and up towards the top. Make sure you don't feel any bind. Because uh, if you do or any pressure on that, chances are you might have to do a little bit of filing on these sort of things just yeah. so that way it's running true. Now these, again, these sort of uh, bearings can take a little bit more, you know, lateral load on them uh, without binding up like a bushing. But I think ideally and in the long run, what I'm going to want to do is do like uh, Walter did on his bed design where he actually put a support at the front and at the back, but bolted to the front of this piece. Because what that gives you is a degree of freedom to mm -hmm. adjust this in relation to all these printed parts of the subassembly where it wants to be instead of like this, forcing it to where it has to be because this is fixed. The other okay. thing that... The other thing that would do is let you not have to buy this expensive machined piece of aluminum there. The bed would just come out here, like on Walter's, a little bit further. Mm -hmm. It would be a square piece, and so long as you could get a square, flattish piece of aluminum and drill four holes with a hand drill, it could be a cost savings on there. So um, I just wanted to get that in the video because it's something I've been on my to-do list for way too long, and I just... I never got around to it, and other people have kind of gone with Walter's design upgrades here recently, so it's kind of self-solved itself, but I don't want the GitHub to have something that, you know, is is less than what I would want to do if I was building the printer myself now. So just thought I'd put that out there. Yeah, talking about beds, I went with a quarter inch because I wanted it really beefy, but... Yeah. It, uh, what's his name from SMW3D? He had a lot of troubles cutting it out because of his warping with the stresses. So I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, what what it is is if you want really flat, they sell something called Mike Six, which is a cast aluminum plate. And the thing about cast aluminum is it's a lot more homogeneous in the stresses that are in it. Whereas if you think about taking steel and you run it through a normal steel mill and you're pressing it flat, running it through rollers, it tends to have a lot of inherent stress in it. So when you cut it, it'll relieve that stress and then the heat along the edge can relieve that stress. So even though you started with a flat piece, it starts relieving that stress. And the same thing happens when you, um, when you heat it because the heat is going to be more concentrated towards the center than the edge, and it, it'll start to kind of relieve some of those stresses. My bed is an eighth-inch piece of, you know, cheap, uh, you know, from the, uh, you know, from the Metal Mart, uh, you know, eighth-inch, like, you know, I can't remember what it was, the grade, you know, whether it was, you know, 60, whatever. Um, but what I ended up having to do on mine, and it's eighth inch, so it made it easier, is I figured out where the crown was, and I marked it with a uh, with a marker. You know, when I I'd take a straight edge to it once it was heated up to temperature, and I figured out where the highest spots were, and I brought it out into the garage with a block of wood and a rubber mallet and straightened it out. <laughs> um, you'll have a lot more trouble doing that with eight with quarter inch, but. I think that it'll be flat enough for you. Are you going to be using glass on top? And, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you use glass on top of it, really all you've got is a gigantic heat sink that'll give you more even heat. So quarter inch is a good call. That's what I would do on mine now if I were to redo it. Um, yeah, that's so. a quarter inch just from the heat. Yeah. All right. Well, any more questions for today? Really, if anybody wants to do something with a Chimera, I may publish mine. I just cleaned up your design a bit. Well, they that's good. Of your Chimera carriage. Yeah, because I, I never really did anything with that one. I printed some versions of it out, but I never actually put it on a printer. And it was the ducting on that I wasn't super happy with. So, yeah, do you know, 
if you could either put it out on like a, like a Google Drive share, I could put it up on the GitHub or because I, I like to put stuff even if you put it on you imagine and other places. Yeah. Just because a lot of people go to the GitHub, so that user mod uh, portion of it, you know, just kind of gives people who might not know other places to look for it a link. But yeah, definitely share it. I, that's what I love most about this community is there's so many people doing cool things off of a similar platform. Yeah, you know. I still gotta work on it. There's a lot of errors in design. Like I'm gonna redo the whole decks because. E3D came out with our new V6.1 or V6.2. So oh, they yeah. Don't so the, fit. They the don't fit nicely cartridge. in the Chimera anymore. Hmm. Oh, one more trick that I want to show you really quick. That It's a super simple, stupid hack, but it's I see a lot of people with their... Uh, Keeping, you know, this upright and a nice kind of gradual curve down to the hot end. Now, I, I let it run a little bit longer because with the Bond Tech, my retractions are so fast anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But I, I like to keep a really even arc on this tube. So, the, you know, I've got these little caps, and you can print them or buy the ones from Misumi's for that top kind of gap on your extrusion there. You know what I mean? Like on the top, it's a, the verticals are a little bit lower. Oh, yeah, I have that as well. Yep, yep. So what I did is the piece of coat hanger with just a little tiny bend in it. And just to kind of guide the wires going up to the hot end. And, uh, of course, I can't get it through there right now. But basically, if you that cap that sits in the top of there in the center of that, that vertical extrusion is hollow. With that little bend in there, it basically just sits on the top of that cap and it can rotate. Mm -hmm. And it just always keeps this nice and upright. Um, you know, your wiring and everything corded right. Because when it goes to the far side, if you don't, it has a real bad tendency to kind of pull over like that. Um, yeah. So just a, just a thought of a way to kind of keep that up there. No. All right. That's all. Thanks so much for doing this. For yeah, helpful. no problem. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully. One thing, telling people don't print out a PLA is all of my parts cracked. <laughs> all your PLA parts are cracked? Yeah. yeah. Every single one. Yeah. Oh, it seemed to have frozen there. Oh my gosh, I didn't even look that the uh, uh, <laughs> the chat was going this whole time. Man, I'm really a terrible host of a. I'm I'm more used to Hangouts, and now I realize YouTube Live has a bunch of stuff going on that I was paying no attention to. Sorry, guys, I'm a big turd. All right, friend who's not he hasn't even built one. He just tuned into the stream. To... Okay. Molest the chat. <laughs> well, thanks everyone, and thanks for taking the time uh, and being put on uh, recorded video, with Stefano. Oh, Stefano. Uh, so this will be a good link for people that are going to be building these here in the in the future because we all run into it. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much for putting in this time. Yep, for sure. Hopefully I'll videos of it printing soon. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.